My name's Bill Rice. It says on the program Andrew was supposed to be presenting, but um, I've, I've been asked to do it on behalf of Andrew, who's um, not here today. Um, I work for a company called Enesis Africa BIM Solutions. Um, I've been in the Autodesk industry close to 30 years, believe it or not, um, 27 um, this year, uh, July. Um, many different guises from technical background to sales, um, vertical developer, so on and so forth. We're now going to uh, be presenting some of this um, as-built technology to you. So I hope you follow along. Um, we have got a booth outside, so if there's anything you want to ask in more detail, we've got a few laptops there, we can probably explain it to you better there. Clicker. Uh, let's do that. I'm sure we all agree um, that there's never, there's always enough time at the end of the project to fix challenges and problems that have ended up on site, but there never seems to be any time to set up correctly in the beginning. Yep, I'm sure a lot of you have um, felt that pain. We bought our first scanner in Houston, Texas in 2004, believe it or not. That's 13 years ago. And this laser scanning device took a long time to acquire data on site. One scan probably took about 35 minutes and it was long. You had to work through the night to get the data and it was, it was really grueling stuff. But we have reduced our acquisition, data acquisition time by 80% today as we speak with the new technology. Um, I don't know how many of you know what laser scanning is about, but here's a short sort of um, video. It just gives you a little bit of background about what laser scanning is actually. This is the um, brand of uh, scanners that we use. I'm Alex. And I'm Laurie. So you're interested in laser scanning. Or, as we at Leica call it, high definition surveying, HDS. Right, and as the industry leader, we're delighted to tell you about it. First off, laser scanning is simply a method of high accuracy mapping. Or reality capture. Right, Laurie. However, unlike methods that only capture specific individual points, one at a time, a scanner quickly captures rich detail of the entire scene. It's like a camera taking a 360 degree photo, but with an accurate position for every pixel. So someone might ask, what's good about that? Well, one obvious benefit is getting better as built or existing conditions information sooner. For design and construction projects, that translates into reduced risks and reduced costs. So we have delivered as um, Fast Track Projects about 13 years ago was the name of the company, but we've delivered around about 1,200 projects now in the last 13 years to companies around the world. We've been to Australia, we've been to Europe, we, Americas, um, not so much in South America, but we have a lot of experience in um, acquiring the three-dimensional data on site and um, sort of processing that to give the client what his requirements are. So one of the client's requirements was a building in Johannesburg in Sandton. And he basically wanted overall dimensions, columns and beam sizes, columns and beam spacing, existing service location, plumbness and flatness of floors. Yeah. Because he basically had a... Um, not very much information. So this is some of the Google images. He told us where it was. We did go and visit it in site, but we had some Google images. And then while on site, we scanned it. 
similar to the way you've seen just now in the video, the small video. And we used Revit to build a Revit model of the building of the office block, those three square sort of buildings. And this is a rendered image of the building. So we, we um, introduced the client to some tools. So we had to use Autodesk Recap Pro to register the number of scans. I think it was around about 500 scans. We used Revit to create the CAD model, the intelligent CAD model. Navis works for some of the clash detection. And then what was interesting was we used PIM 360 to communicate some of the changes and queries that we had. BIM 360 glue. This is just a, a Navisworks um, quick animation of the 3D model. So this is just the structure of that um, building that existed that the owner had no information of for whatever reason. And there's not much in the way of fittings like lighting and MEP stuff, but it was a start for the client um, to understand the space, the um, integrity of the structure. He could see the size of the columns and he knew how old the building was, so he more or less knew what type of rebar and what type of strength was in the columns. So from this, he was able to make a lot of decisions that he wasn't able to prior to that. So um, debating further with the um, client, we uncovered <laughs> a few more things that he, he wasn't quite aware of at the time. Yep. So we introduced him to what we call in our company the BIM maturity levels. So what we have done as a company, we have standardized on the UK government strategy and we are using the British standards 1192, used to be the old PACE, 1192-2. But we have, we have taken that carbon copy and we have implemented it in our business and that's how we sort of interrogate the clients that we're working for to understand what maturity level are you in as far as BIM is concerned. So let me just pause there for a second and talk about BIM as an acronym. What does BIM stand for? Anybody? Many different yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Many different things. Um, building information modeling, business information modeling. But one of the, <laughs> this is quite funny, one of the interesting things was we came across this document. Um, if I can just go to it now. This document called um, oh, it's not that one. Sorry, find it right now. It should have been open, but it's not. It was um, published by an architect, and it's basically. Um, 10 pages of acronyms for, <laughs> for BIM um, that are associated with BIM. So Bond Brand Architects, they're out of London, but there's actually 10 pages of acronyms that are associated with BIM. So as you can imagine, BIM is quite confusing. So there are maturity levels that the UK government has standardized on and as I said we are implementing that with some of our customers so there is confusion when it comes to what level of BIM are, are you currently at so if we look at these levels here level zero is basically paper drawings maybe CAD maybe lines circles and arcs 2d drawing that would be level zero. Some clients haven't even got paper drawings. But the confusion comes in when people say, no, we've got a 3D model and we've got it on the network and multiple people are supplying information into it. We must be at level five. 
because it goes all the way up to level 7. So there is sort of backwards and forwards between clients, always this confusion about how far are we? What standard do I use? There's, there's a local company, the BIM Institute in Cape Town, that's trying to drive these type of standards and try and get a standard that everyone is working towards. So as a company, we have adopted this um, standard and it's how we sort of gauge where our clients are and try and move them along. So that particular client who had a Revit model completed, he was basically sitting at level zero. But just by scanning the plant, creating a Revit model, started him moving from level zero to level one. A few of our clients have some applications like, you know, some have PDF copies of their building or their hospital or their plant. Some have hand-drawn sketches <laughs> scanned in and then written on over the top as well. So that's their record. They're level zero, if not less. Across these types of um, technologies here, we have used the BIM 360 docs to sort of bring in the various files, RVTs, PDFs, um, some 2D drawings that have been scanned and you've ended up with JPEGs. We've used them and brought them in to BIM docs, BIM 360 docs. And the BIM 360 docs allows the communication to flow a lot smoother. So in BIM 360 docs, we can publish the Revit files. Yeah, We can share them because multiple um, users can access the, the same source of truth, if you like. They can all view the same documents. And they can mark up and red line and make comments on them as well. So we introduced this client not only to 3D modeling, Revit, Intelligent, CAD models, BIM 360, we've now introduced them to BIM Docs. So this is an ongoing process that we've engaged with the client to move him from the maturity level that he found himself in when he engaged with us initially to the next level, the next BIM level. So he's now got 2D drawings from his 3D model, he's got some um, electronic files, Excel files, he's got some PDF files, and he is moving along. This particular client, this client had a, is an owner operator in, in South Africa. He had some PNID drawings, which are piping and instrument station drawings, electronic copies of them. He also had some PDF um, formats of the PNID drawings, but multiple versions with multiple comments on the drawings. So this particular client said to us, please expose our management to this BIM maturity, the different levels of BIM maturity, and where do we start? So we said we can take some of your, your 2D data, but you don't have any drawings of the physical representation of the plant, so we will have to acquire that. So then we introduced them to our laser scanning service, and we acquired initially the scan data, the three-dimensional data of their plant. So this is some of the data of their plant.
welfare, safety, medical, and blah, blah, blah. We were on site for four hours, so we completed this. We did about, I think we did about 30 What's We spent some time with them, and we reviewed the data. And as we were walking through the plant, he said, look, can you put more information on there? Can you add to the already existing physical dimensions? Of course we can. So in this video, what we did was we reviewed this plant with the client. And he said, hey, that's a control valve. We need information in there. So we start adding some information to it. At this stage, we had hyperlinks that connect us to panoramic images in that CAD model. So if we click on the, the camera hyperlink here, it takes us to panoramic images of the plant, which we can measure. This type of information would sit on the network, for instance, so that multiple users could access the same, the same data. We it takes time. There is a process from the three-dimensional data to the CAD model so that you can start adding um, more information into the CAD model. But more and more clients are asking us to go and scan the plant and use the point cloud information to apply hyperlinks that link to data. So they don't want to use the CAD model anymore. They're moving away from the CAD model and they're asking us to insert hyperlinks that connect to databases that could have been created by the CAD um, component. But if it's not, it may be an SQL database and that hyperlink can connect to the data. So when you click on a particular um, hyperlink in the point cloud, it automatically takes you to a database um, cell giving you the relevant information about that inline item, for instance, maybe the, the control valve. So it's, it's becoming more prevalent that the clients want the point cloud information and not necessarily the CAD component of it. Um, let's just move on here to the next. So again, we were explaining to the management of this particular owner operator that you know, you, you're sl slowly moving from the lower levels of BIM maturity into a higher level. And, and why do you think that might be a good thing for a business? I mean, it, it seems quite obvious to me, but I'm talking to you, so I know the answer. Um, it's, it's more about collaboration. So if, if your standards are starting to be documented in a certain way, if your um, place of data being housed is in a central place, then 
clients start to get more clarity on the communication between a contractor and an owner-operator, for instance, or even within the owner-operator's facility, the different departments. So, you know, the process department are talking to the maintenance department. So if they start moving and start standardizing the process flow of information, it, it makes the efficiency of the unit or the facility a lot greater and more easier to understand. Um, so, uh, as I say, we move the client along this list and the management of that particular facility, we're starting to get to grips with the service provision of, of what we did. Um, this, this particular um, service talks about the information that is siloed. So, even though we were talking about CAD and laser scan data and Excel spreadsheets, there are other applications out there like SAP. Um, there are uh, preventative maintenance applications like Maximo. I don't know how many of you have heard of Maximo. There are Oracle applications that um, allow uh, companies to manage their facility. And all of these applications are basically siloed information because a lot of them they have to either print out a report and go to a meeting and speak to the maintenance people with their reports so they all have information and it is um, stored in that that application but to get to it is often quite difficult um, I don't know how many of you have worked with SAP. There's a SAP document management program that is very clunky. It, it, um, it doesn't talk nicely to a lot of maintenance programs. So you've basically got to print out reports, um, maybe in an Excel format, and then bring those reports to the maintenance people and compare the information from those two siloed information um, programs. So there is a lot of data there in the system, but it's often difficult to get the data from one application to the other. Um, so this is a, an article that was published by, I think it's the National Institute of standards and technology in America. And basically what they're saying is there is billions of rand dollars, sorry, billions of dollars a year that is spent by various contractors, owner operators, um, speciality fabricators and suppliers, owner operators, there's billions of dollars wasted on people finding data. Literally, hey, I'm sure we had that drawing. Didn't Roger do that drawing last month or last year? We definitely had it. But they're saying that the amount of time it takes to locate data is phenomenal. And it is expensive. So you can see here that architects and engineers, a billion, a billion dollars in planning design. Construction fees, they say they're $147 million. This is just in one year. So it's a massive market, and it's a big, big problem for people who can't share data. They, can't, they, they know it's there somewhere. It's either in the CAD package, or it's in the preventative maintenance package, or it's in the process department somewhere. Um, so it's, it's a big, big problem. So. Our method of implementing BIM at a company and using those standards, those maturity level standards, should clear up a lot of the, um, the, the misconceptions between the drawing office, for instance, and the maintenance department, or the drawing office and the estimating department. Because if the procurement department needs to purchase valves or equipment for the plant or for the maintenance, they need to get information from the design office or the drawing office, which is readily available to get them to purchase the correct component. So this was um, 
This is some real data. Okay, it's in America, but it gives us a, an indication of similar things happening in South Africa. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, a system that we have introduced into South Africa. It's called Datum 360. This is a product that was um, born about seven years ago. And it's built on the Autodesk Forge platform. Um, I don't know many of you have, there was, a, there was a session now about Forge, but it's built on Autodesk's Forge technology. And it, it basically allows any file format, any data, to be housed in the cloud. So that when we go to a client, we establish with the client a standard that they are going to use if they're an owner operator or if they're a contractor a standard that they will hand over to the final end user so this standard would be called a class library and we would define that class library with the end in mind so how do you want your standards to look what's your tag format what type of information are you going to have in your class library? All of that would be determined up front, and it all sits in the cloud. So we are the representatives for this product in South Africa called Datum360, and it will pull the laser scan data that we showed earlier. It will pull the CAD data, the CAD metadata, the Maximo preventative maintenance information. It will pull that into the class library and then allow you to have that as a source of true data. So if you need to make a change to the data in that um, class library, there's methods and functions in the cloud through the application, the desktop, the, sorry, the dashboard application, which is called PIM360, that allows you to create an engineering information change. And it's a bi-directional link to the programs. So if the guy who's using SAP is busy with information and there's an engineering information change that is sent to the SAP user, he then updates his SAP system and then exports it straight back to the cloud. So reporting is very simple in this and the amount of data that is processed into the class library is given a percentage complete. So if, if I could give you an example, if you're working on the plant and there's a number of different valves on the plant, the valve information of the PNID may come into the class library and that might be 50% of the information. But the actual maintenance of the valves has, that information has to come from Maximo. So when that information comes from Eximo and it's pushed into the class library, the um, information completion status may go from 50% to 75%, still leaving 25% outstanding. But the completion of the 100% completion would be acquired when all of the data about a specific component, like a valve, is then logged into the class library. So we believe this would move your BIM maturity level from level zero at least to BIM level three, where you've got intelligent CAD models, you've got data from your process, um, process engineering status, you've got data from your Revit models, the intelligent Revit model, so your MEP systems, the power rating, the electrical light information, all of that information could be acquired from the Revit model and pushed into a central location sitting in the cloud using Datum360. We, we have got um, lots of clients who are using this in the petrochemical industry. Um, to date, in South Africa, we don't have anyone who is working in the commercial um, market. So, you know, if it's um, facilities management or, you know, hospital 
planning stuff like that. we haven't got any client and we would like to try and um, address a client and maybe set up a pilot site where we can um, utilize this system and try and get every working everyone working on the central um, cloud based system um, the system itself is a um, subscription based um, uh, payment on a, on a monthly basis and it works not in the way of licensing where you would purchase a license for this particular product. It works on sort of assets within your facility. So in a hospital there may be, call it 5,000 assets and those assets are then given a price to be housed in the cloud. Um, one, on a plant, on an engineering plant, maybe petrochemical or mining, there are plant assets that, you know, they get it up to the hundreds of thousands. And these assets are then given a price. So it, it ranges from zero to 25,000 assets. And just to give you an idea of how long it takes us to get those 25,000 assets into the cloud, it takes in the region of two weeks, two to three weeks to come to your site and you're allocated a description of the 25,000 assets and it takes us roughly 25, uh, two to three weeks to get those 25,000 assets into the class library so that you can start accessing the data and comparing the data from the various different siloed products and make comparisons but it would be one source of um, information with a bi-directional link to the various applications. So you wouldn't have to get rid of your CAD packages. We're, we're not promoting the, the um, dumping of CAD products in any way. So you would still be using your Revit and your plant and your Civil 3D and you would still be using your SAP. And as you're continually using that stuff, it would be sending the data automatically up to the cloud so that it could be viewed via the class library into the dashboard for pulling reports and comparing the um, percentage complete. So it's a way of owner operators managing their contractors or owner operators managing the progress of particular projects within the facility. So the, um, in this particular case, we managed to move this um, facility, this client, this owner operator in South Africa, we managed to get him to BIM level three. So moving from BIM level three, you can then start using the um, 4D and 5D um, simulation, 4D simulation, 5D costing type applications in Navisworks to push them along that BIM maturity scale. Um, that's, that's what we have standardized in our business and it's what we are presenting to clients on a regular basis. This is the front end of the um, Datum 360. So this particular dashboard is PIM 360 and this is where we would um, interrogate the information that is being stored in the class library. So what you're seeing here is um, multiple views that are spread out on the screen. This is a list of attributes. This is a 2D intelligent drawing, an AutoCAD PNID drawing and this is a 3D model. This viewer is the Forge viewer, Autodesk Forge viewer, which allows us to bring multiple different file formats, whether it be Autodesk, Revit, Plant, Navisworks, Smart Plant for that matter, um, Aviva's um, E3D, any type of file format can be brought into this viewer and reviewed as a central repository for, for the data. Any questions? That's that's pretty much me. We have a um, a little stand just out the door to the right. Um, Bruce is around here. Colleen is around. If 
If I'm not there, you can speak to Bruce or Colleen if there's any specific questions. Yes. Um, there, there's no automatic process of getting the point cloud into Revit. It's, it's almost like that point cloud information you can snap to every single point. So this device acquires 500,000 points per second. So as it shoots out a laser beam from a central origin point, it, it creates a pixel. So you can snap to that pixel to create your dimensional data that you need to create your Revit model. It's, it's a manual process. Yeah, the, well, you know, the, the, it's more about the process in your organization. So when you scan the data, if I'm, I'm scanning a thousand tripod positions, that's going to be a big file. So when you're planning the workflow, you would break the recap projects into smaller workflows so that you're only bringing in a portion of the point cloud. You don't need to bring the thousand scans into a Revit model, and that's how we work. We don't bring the complete. Um, on that particular building, it was broken up into 10 projects. So that if we're working on a lower level, we might have multiple people working on different parts of the, of the, the model, the Revit model. Yeah. It is. The, Yes, there, there, there are some semi-automated routines, like if it sees a, f a, a, a number of points um, looking like a wall, it assumes that that would be a wall. And it does assume that the doors and some of the, the basic features that are uniform, but where you've got irregular shapes, it's not going to recognize that. So there, is a se there are semi-automated routines which does help with the conversion between point cloud to CAD model. And, and we can show you some of those um, at the at the stand. Yeah. So it it is getting better. I mean, there there is a movement for scan, push a button, and hopefully you get a CAD model. But that's that's utopia. It, but they are working on it. They, they, you know, at some stage it will definitely come because already they're creating surfaces, which is not necessarily solids at this stage. But it is a surface representation of the environment. It's it's a bit clunky. It's a bit clunky, but it's smaller in size than the solid model or the Revit model. But it's getting there. They, I mean, everyone's asking for it. But at this stage, it is still sort of a semi-automated process from the point cloud data to the, the CAD environment. But as I said earlier, there is a move for people using the point cloud information because the data has become so rich. And it's, the, it's just the processing power then of the size of the plant and how much the projects have been broken down into smaller chunks. Hi. Yeah. It's there, there's a survey grid. Yes, yeah, we can work on planes. We can define a UCS or a work plane. We can define that using the point cloud information and then work back from that. But with re reference to the, um, the, the different scan positions, you need to have a reference grid, almost like a survey grid that we build, and then we attach the point cloud data to that grid. Yeah, so it knows north, east, and elevation. 
Thank you. If you can maybe pop around and see us there. We'll spend some time with you if you have any more detailed questions. Thank you.